Hey everybody, Haku here with uh, this week's read-through video for Magical Girl Raising Project Restart. This week is Chapter 5, The Dragon and the Chinese Girl. So, uh, please no, please no Miyakata and uh, Nyan Nyan try to kill each other. I like them both. Do not do this. Work together, everyone, please. Now that Cherna is, uh, Cherna has been thoroughly rulered. Uh, so pretty much, before I start, I'm going to separate this into two, well, I'm... I'm going to record this in two separate parts. I'm going to record the first 21, 21 pages uh, right now, and then tomorrow I'll record the, the last second 21 pages. Um, and I don't know if I'll post them separately as two separate videos or edit them together into one. It depends on how long they are. Um, if it's around an hour or a little bit over under that, I'll probably um, put it together into one video. But if it's like 45 minutes each, then I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep it as two separate videos. So uh, it depends on how long it takes to read and discuss and all that. So either way, let's go ahead and get into it. I uh, pretty much just said what happened at the end of last week's. Cherna got rulered. Um, and I guess that's pretty much it. I mean, a lot happened as usual, and it was really, really good. Maybe possibly the best chapter yet. I don't know. I thought it was really good last week. Um... But yeah, the big thing that I remember is Cherna at the end, because that scene had me going crazy. That was such a great scene. Uh, but either way, Chapter 5, The Dragon and the Chinese Girl, starting out with Pechka, uh, from her perspective, of course. Cherna Mouse had collapsed, but it looked like somebody else's problem. <laughs> Someone checked Cherna... Okay, Pechka. Someone checked Cherna Mouse's magical phone. They shouted out that Cherna had one less candy compared to everyone else. Fle, who was in charge of the checking, had been blamed makes sense. Someone pleaded in her defense for some reason agreeing with her. Everyone was uneasy. They were guaranteed safety by fall, so why did they fail? They discussed, they shouted, they pressed at each other. What happened? Why did this happen? They insisted, they argued, yet there was no conclusion. Even if they asked fall what was wrong, he wasn't in a talking state. Detic Bell's party buried Cherna Mouse outside of the plaza. The other parties also separated in small groups. The anxiety that was unseen formed in their chest. Pechka didn't know why, but she was aware that a life had been stolen for no reason. Even though she was pulled into this game, even though her head was dizzy thinking about being forced to be in a game where she could die, even though the rules of the game were ambiguous, she didn't know what reason there was for the death. Okay, sorry I stumbled up on my words there. While I was reading, I was also simultaneously thinking about uh, uh, how many people were gone from each team. Okay, back back now to uh, talking. Um, two hours after Chernomouse collapsed, just before... That's where I am, right? Yeah. Two hours after Chernomouse collapsed, just before they returned to reality, Rianetta and Miyakata Nanako argued. Clintail annoyedly stomped her hooves. Pechka looked up at the sky. There were no stars, moon, or clouds, only a pitch black sky. Rianetta and Miyakata Nunako, seeing Pechka staring at the sky of nothingness, stopped their arguing and looked up. Clantail stopped stomping her hooves and also looked up. Rianetta muttered, This will make hunting quite easier. Chernomouse was the gatekeeper occupying good hunting grounds. If she was gone, then Pechka's group can enter those hunting grounds without anyone complaining. On the contrary, it was Pechka's group that currently has four members without losing even one of their party, so that means they have the number one strongest combat strength of any party, right? Pechka became sad when she thought of such a thing. She looked at her other party members. Rianetta, who had already opened her mouth, had no question on what she thought. Nako and Clantail nodded, both thinking the same thing. Pechka became even more sad. When Chica returned to reality, she first looked at the sky. Two thirds of the, looked at the sky. Two thirds of the crescent moon were hidden behind clouds. The stars were also covered behind the dark gray clouds, making them unseen to her. Still, it was a night sky like any other. She came back safely, and she appreciated seeing this night sky. After she woke up in the morning, she washed her face. Before breakfast, she raised incense into the family altar and clasped her hands together. Until now, she's never had these habits. Although she was not really a faithful girl, there really is nothing she, else she could do. Her brother was laughing, her parents were concerned, her grandfather praised her in admiration. Those reactions that she got left and right were probably because Chica placed her hands together. She was aware that she looked a bit comical. 
However, if she could rely on it, she wanted to cling to anything she had. In school, there were often many things she was embarrassed about. On the way to school, she bumped into a utility pole. In the middle of class, she was pointed out by her teacher, the surrounding students blurting out in laughter. Chica, who had always tried to be inconspicuous, was being laughed at. Before she would feel down for a week, now she didn't care. She had no care because she was thinking about the game. How was she going to open the next area, where the, where the monsters found their ideal for hunting? She wasn't doing this because she wanted to clear the area, but part of it was because she wanted to make sure she was safe. The other part was drowned in imagining the way she could die. The reading club, the reading club stood up after 30 minutes. Her friends were worried, but she said it's nothing, while strongly showing her smile. Hurriedly, she returned home and transformed into Pechka. She dug up the soil in, her, soil in her garden and placed it into a pot. From there, she transformed it into lunch. Rolled omelets, asparagus, bacon, oct octopus wiener. Okay, that, I, know what it, I know what it's referring to, uh, but it just sounds weird put like that. Sprinkled rice, deep fried chicken, pe petite tomatoes, and occasionally spinach. The fruits were unpacked. Or the fruits were packed in another Tupperware. She thought the contents were a bit childish. Would it be fun to eat this kind of lunch, Chica thought, as she made it according to her hobbies. Maybe she should take a look at some websites and study from there. She changed her clothes and left to the sports arena. On the way, she helped an old man load radishes onto his truck. He thanked her, and she responded with a smile. In her heart, helping people at a time like this felt like self-deprecation. It was an escape from reality. After watching their practice session, she ran towards the park. The crows were calling. It was that time of day where the red evening sky glared in her eyes. Soon it got dark. Nina Miyakun literally rushed toward her. In the sports arena, there were night equipment. As soon as it got dark, they practiced with lights on. Several insects gathered over at the light. Sometimes beetles would show up, and in the summer, kids and enthusiasts who aren't interested in baseball would also show up. Nina Miyakun, who had just finished his night practice, made it in time to eat the food that was prepared. When the two of them were finished eating, he got closer to Pechka. He gratefully said, thanks again for the meal to her. When he thanked her, Pechka felt happy and slightly embarrassed. While Nina Miyakun was eating, Pechka sat on the same bench, watching him from a distance. Occasionally their eyes would meet and she'd get worried if he knew she'd been watching him forever, so she would look away, but... Once he began eating the delicious food again, she looked me and me and me and me and me more. Delicious food, trademarked. Um, he had a shaved face, sometimes still having traces of his beard. In class, even though Pechka thought that he was still young, Ninamiyakun acted more like an adult man. His strong chest muscles moved up and down together as his cheeks and jaws were chewing. Wait, his chest moved while he was chewing? Um, what is wrong with you, Nina Miyakun? Uh, on his cheeks, there were small traces of acne. He was still a middle schooler. And this man's a middle schooler? After practice, he ran all the way here, sweating as a result. You could still smell traces of it, and Pechka's cheeks turned red. Even though he was eating vigorously, he still held his chopsticks in the correct position as if he was a prim and proper boy. Some rice grain stuck to his cheeks. Should Pechka point it out? Should she just take it off? If she waited for a while before he ate it, it might be bad for him, won't it? So she should wrap it in a tissue and throw it away. While, he w while she was worrying about it, Nina Miyakun picked up the rice with his fingers and ate it. On this day, Petka observed Nina Miyakun's face and eating gestures. She didn't talk much. Just thinking about talking made Petka nervous. She didn't want to bother Nina Miyakun with his innocent cheeks enjoying her cooking. However, on the second day, Nina Miyakun spoke unexpectedly. Petka listened to the topics he liked to talk about. Recently, his batting has been pretty good. Sometimes his coach would bring his dog over. It was a big dog with a scary-looking face. He got, he got angry because he couldn't play in the knuckleball practice. Because his bike is broken, he's had to run to school. All of those topics he talked about, all of those, were all topics he talked about fondly. Petka was also happy if she saw Nina Miyakun having fun. So how are you doing? Asked Nina Miyakun. Pechka was stuck, thinking of an answer. She's no she's noticed. Pechka couldn't talk about herself. She couldn't talk about her being a magical girl. She couldn't talk about the unreasonable game she was being forced into playing. She can't just introduce herself as Chica, either. 
Even though she goes to the same school as him, when she's Chica, she's not Pechka. Even if it's, er, even if it isn't a lie, it's still a lie. Even if he looks for her at school, she couldn't make him delicious food because she wasn't wasn't Pechka. Delicious food trademark. She always cooks for her. We should just do the uh, for you those of you watching drinking game. Take a shot every time they say delicious food. <laughs> um, hold on, I lost my place. Okay, she always cooks for her friends, and even though they do say it's delicious, Nina Mia Kun told her that if anyone thinks her food isn't delicious, that they can't be human. He laughed at that. Petchka also laughed, but inside she was slowly sinking. The third day, once the day was over, she'll be called back to the game. Then she'll have to survive for three more days. I hate it. I want to cry. I'm feeling depressed. At the very least, I want to be able to do everything I can here. Even if I can't be saved, at least I could feel a sense of compassion. Even though she thought of all those things, she could say none of them. She'd die if she did. Pechka talked about herself, not Chika Tatahara. Not Pechka the magical girl. She talked about this fictitious girl who went to a neighboring high school and loved cooking and watching baseball. She was taught cooking by her mother. Her mom was a better cook than Pechka. Recently, when a cat pooped in her garden, her grandfather was mad. A friend of hers slipped on a banana peel and fell, just like those comedy manga. Although she went to karaoke, she put in a random song. It was, it was a song she knew by chance, so she sang it from beginning to end. Nina Miyakun laughed at her fictional failures, and Pechka also smiled, suppressing her sadness and adversity inside. After finishing his meal, Nina Miyakun got closer to Pechka as usual, returning her lunchbox. While they were exchanging it, their pinky fingers touched each other. Nina Miyakun looked flustered and left afterwards, running off. Pechka looked at her pinky fingertips. She wrapped her hands around it, grasping it tightly. Man, it's like... That's so sad. Like, it's building up so much for Petch could have the death I thought Snow White was going to have but didn't, you know? I love seeing the um, characters in their three days off, though. Like, it's just so cool to see them outside of being a magical girl and being stuck into the game, just like with the first um, arc. Either way, now we have Shadow Gale to talk about, and of course that was a great scene. It was similar to all the other Pechka development scenes, just really building up sympathy for her, which makes me think, oh, poor, poor Pechka child. Um, either way, Shadow Gale, uh, Kanaway was buried in her thoughts. To be exact, she wasn't concealing that she was buried deep in thought. That was abnormal. Her parents and older brother were concerned. She'd be asked, what are you worried about? But Kanoe simply smiled and said, there's nothing to worry about, which only made them more concerned. So, Kanoe is Shadow Gale, correct? And then Mamori is, um, Mamori is Fleth. I always feel like I'm getting the two mixed up. But either way, that means Shadow Gale has parents and an older brother all still alive. Hold on. Fucking pinky finger hurts. Okay. More concern. Mori was also questioned by Kanoe. She didn't answer. If she could, she'd like to answer that the lady of the house is a magical girl and is playing a game where defeat equals death. Kanoe was still thinking about something now. That's fine. Mori was also full of thoughts, but if it's Mori, she tends to have a place to think. If she wants to think about something, she'll go to her room. Like Kanoe, she, would, she wouldn't occupy someone else's room. She placed wine and crackers on a tray, not drinking or eat or eating in other study desks. She didn't drop the crackers she placed on the desk either. Isn't she a little bit young for wine? Either way, Mamori rose, raising the blinds, opening the windows. Late autumn breeze was chilly and cool, or the late autumn breeze was chilly and cool. The sultry heat inside the room escaping outside. Fresh air came inside, the blue lawn spread outwards. Since it was night time, it was tinged with a dark purple color. Tall hedges surrounded the gardens. The insect noises were comforting to her ears. It was said that they bought the pine crickets and released them there. She heard it cost them a thousand yen each. She liked to think that it was an exaggeration. Mamori left the window, returning to her bed and sitting down. She looked at Kanaway. She was still thinking about something while on her rotating chair. At least act like this is your room. The Totoyama family is a member of the Hitokoji family, 
living together. Momori's room was also in the Hitokoji house, thus they shared a room. Even if Konoe used it freely, it was hard for Momori to complain. Okay. So... So Momori... Okay, so Kanoe is Shadow Gale. Hold on. Let's end about... No. Okay, so hold on. Kanoe has older brothers and parents. Kanoe is Fleth. And Memori is Shadow Gale. Okay, hold on. Read that. Because that's... I thought it was the other way around, though. So... Memoria Shadow Gale, hold on. There's also full of thoughts, but it's just a place to think. Okay. Okay. Hold on. So, Momori, Shadow Gale left the window, returning to her bed and sitting down. She looked at Kanoe, which is Fleh. She was still thinking about something while on her rotating chair. At least act like this is your room. The Totoyami family is a ma member of the Hitokoji family, living together. Momori's room was also in the Hitokoji house, thus they shared a room. Even if Kanoe used it freely, it was hard for Momori to complain. So... I, I thought Mamo I thought it was Mamori Hitokoji, but I guess it's Kanoe Hitokoji. So Kanoe Hitoko So even if Le used Shadow Gale's room it'd be hard for Shadow Gale to complain. Because that that's why I decided that I had it backwards, because um because, I mean, it would be easy for Kanoe to complain if she's Fle, because Fle's the one that Shadow Gale serves. Either way, I'll continue on. But that chair was different. It was a mail-ordered furniture catalog bought for 35,000 yen made in Europe. Momori bought it with all the savings she had, thinking it was a wonderful and comfortable chair, not minding Momori's personal belonged not minding Momori's personal belongings, even if she was under the Hitokoji household, she should have no right to do that. Can you at least give me my chair back? Momori, are you thinking about something? Says Bleh. Answering a question with a question, however, she was right. Momori was thinking about something. Momori had heard, or Momori had something bothering her mind. She couldn't find the answer. Why did Chair and a Mouse have the least amount of candies? She didn't understand anything. She didn't even know how it was even possible in the first place. Before the logout period, after the event where Chernomouse died, Detic Bell and Melville tried to resuscitate her. Neither mouth-to-mouth -mouth nor ca cardiac massaging worked. Even if they used healing medicine, she couldn't come back. The cause of her death was heart paralysis. According to Fall's explanation of the event rules, the one player who possesses the least amount of candies will be eliminated. The conditions of least amount in one player if either of those conditions aren't satisfied, they won't be eliminated. Fly guessed that if there were multiple people who had the same amount, then no one would be eliminated. Fall even admitted so himself. If two or more people had the least amount of magical candies, the event will end without any eliminations. Everyone cooperated to equalize their candies. Fly confirmed them. They had briefly thought that with this, they could overcome the event. Then, Chernomast collapsed. Her name was called. When they checked Chernomouse's magical phone, the number of magical candies displayed on the screen was one less than everyone else. Everyone began to condemn Fla because it seemed like she didn't check the candy amount um, tightly. Several people denied that. Fla lost her wheelchair in a battle with Chernomouse, piggybacking on Shadow Gale to move. She confirmed from behind there in the center of the fountain, with the magical girls making a circle looking at each other. And it certainly wasn't just Fla, but Shadow Gale as well. Shadow Gale wasn't just for walking, but she also saw the magical phones. Everyone really did have the same amount. There was no one that had a different amount than anyone else. The other magical girls also testified Fla's innocence. No one made any strange movements. The surrounding magical girls were all being watched over by each other because they couldn't trust each other. Or maybe they wanted to trust each other so they kept their eyes on them. To the right of Chernomouse was Dedic Bell, to the left was Melville. Both of them admitted that Chernomouse's candies matched theirs. Then why did Chernomouse die? 
What was the reason for having one less magical candy than everyone else? The answer never came. So I'm thinking maybe Detic's a more likely suspect than Flair right now. Either that or like somebody said in the comments that... And like I was saying, Nyan Nyan's kind of sketchy last week with the uh, death of Masked Wonder. Um, so maybe not Nyan Nyan is sketchy in this as well. But I don't know. To me, she doesn't seem like it. It's like she has the capability. She has the means. But I don't see the motive for Nyan Nyan. But either way, I see the motive for Detic though. And for Flynn, they both, they're both cunning, so I feel like they could have maybe found some sort of means. But either way, gonna keep reading. Um, if they activated your magical phone, you could transfer candies, but that was already possible since before. Well, they, unless it was something that they did using Yemenashima, but I don't know. While they were equalizing their candies, the beep 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 beep, beep sound that played beep 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 beep, beep whenever they transfer echoed across the square. As Shadow Gale checked the phones, she also checked both sides, stopping if the numbers are different. Did someone manipulate a magical phone using magic? That's not possible. Even though magical phones are physical things that can't be beaten up, there was nothing inside of them. Even if you tried to manipulate it outside with magic, it'll just break. Shadow Gale herself had tried that. Or maybe it's possible that uh, whoever was running the game just lowered the number by one the master just lowered it by one to make them all suspect each other, like I was saying, it's this outside force. Either way, though. Um, Chernomouse's candies. Kanoe said what Mamori was thinking. Kanoe took out Mamori's math notepad from her desk drawer. Uncapping it, she wrote the magical girls' names, their party, and their magical skills. That's my notes, and my pen. Ah, yes, I'm gonna borrow it for a bit. Party A. Fla, high performance wheelchair. <laughs> okay. Sh Shadow Gale, modifying machinery. Party B, Clan Tail, changes lower half to animals. Rionetta, manipulates dolls. Uh, Miyakata Nanako, befriending animals. Uh, Pechka, makes delicious food, trademark. Uh, party C, Chair and a Mouse's party. Um, Detic Bell, communicates with buildings. In game usage is limited. Um, and she was right to the right of Cherna Mouse. Melville melts into the landscape, was to the left of Cherna Mouse. Lapis Lazuline teleports with gems. Okay, makes sense. Um, Cherna Mouse grows bigger, victim. Noko-chan transmits her emotions. At Nyan Nyan puts objects in scrolls. Yemenashima Genesiko invincible suit, magical phone only. Yes, yeah, so and none of their abilities really technically, I guess, make it make sense, unless it's a stretch with Nyan Nyan's. So now we know for sure what Lapis Lazuline's is, but I'm wondering, how does Fle know each and every one of their abilities like that? Has Fle seen all of their abilities in action? I mean, I guess maybe she has seen, her or her team has maybe seen all of them in action, or Detic Bell has explained hers to everyone. But either way, interesting, interesting. The breakdown table that she wrote had more information than Mamori expected. Why is it this detailed? Even though they never told you, you knew about their magical skills? Just as you were in charge of, charge of hunting Mamori, I am in charge of information gathering, and I have many acquaintances. While we were all in the square, I asked a question. Although the samurai magical girl was supposed to be the criminal, the murderer, the murderer of our ally, who was killed and had her item stolen, hasn't changed. Everyone didn't want to be suspected and was hiding something. Now that she said that, Mamori knew for the first time, and you can't believe that. Hold on. Okay, and you can't believe that. I asked the other party's magical girls in that place. If they lied, there would be some reaction. Even if I didn't accuse them of lying, an unnatural reaction will always appear. But if someone is falsifying their magic, then it's different. If someone was misrepresenting their magical skill, then she would be the culprit. So do you know the culprit? Was there someone who could use their magic to alter Chernomouse's candies? I don't know. Ah, so yeah, what if their magical skill isn't quite what they're saying it is? That could be true. You don't know. Perhaps I should rephrase myself. I need no evidence. Just seeing the person is enough for me. These notes I present to you, Mamori, is a sign of goodwill. 
I'm not going to try to identify the culprit based on motivation or opportunity. You're different though, aren't you, Mamori? So these will be useful to you. Kanoe pushed the notes to Mamori. She held a stuffed bear sitting at the side of her bed and leaned back on her chair. While she was indulging in her thoughts, she didn't know how Chernomouse's candy was reduced nor on her culprit. Mamori felt disappointed. She couldn't understand it, and while she made a disappointed face, she sat down on her bed, and afterwards she laid down. Knowing everyone's magical skill, in addition to the items in the game, she began to think about how Chernomouse's candy could be reduced. She couldn't think of anything. It was impossible. Even if they could destroy a magical phone, they can't manipulate a magical phone as they wanted. The only way to turn off the sound is to turn off the magical phone itself, so that won't work either. The best candidate for actually being able to do something like that would be Shadow Gale. Her remodeling magic had a wide variety of applications. She could modify a magical phone to not make it make any noises and display anything when transferring candy, probably. But Mamori knew she, knew she couldn't possibly be the culprit. She didn't do it. However, Mamori only knew this because, of course, she would know about herself. Everyone else wouldn't think that Mamori was innocent. She also had a motive. My team was defeated by Chernomouse in a duel. Mamori wondered if anyone su suspected her. I didn't do it. I know you didn't. Kanoe, well, she would say that. If I... If others asked her even if Mamori doesn't see it, she'll probably defend her too. Whether or not people would accept it is another matter. Don't worry, I have no doubts. No, but thinking normally, I think I'd be more, ex I'd be suspected more than others. You won't, because I told everyone that your magical skill was creating tanks. Mamori looked hesitantly at Kanoe. Kanoe instantly stared back with a blank expression. That's why you won't get suspected in the first place, right? I guess. Mamori raised her body from her bed. Asked Wonder's killer and her items thief. We still haven't found her yet. That we haven't. Master Wonder was killed, her item was robbed, the miracle coin, despite not being on anyone's magical phone, someone still had it. The item state is said to be 1-1. One, one. So whose magical phone had it? The miracle coin, chair and a mouse, both of these situations are impossible ones. Both of them involved magical phones, which means the same culprit? That's possible. But what's the motive? I love this. Let me say I love the scene. I think that um, Flez actually, we knew that she was really smart, but I like that we're seeing how Mamori thinks and stuff. Um, for Masked Wonder's murder, they probably wanted to steal the miracle coin. Still, even if it's rare, who would kill for such a vaguely useful item? Even at that time, the link between life and death it hadn't been revealed, and these were supposed to be magical girls of justice. For Chairna Mouse, maybe she was in the way. She was responsible for driving out and disallowing entry to other parties looking for good hunting grounds. It certainly wasn't fun to have an obstacle in game. Both motivations involved the game, Masked Wonder's murder and Chairna Mouse's murder. All had a motivation not to play the game, but to escape the game. By proceeding along the game, you could escape the game. Chairna Mouse's party was selfish, but not enough to kill. She didn't know what events would come next. Just because Chairna Mouse wasn't here doesn't mean an undefeatable monster would show up. If the Demon Lord was a 100 meter, 15,000 ton monster, could Chairna Mouse defeat it? Would Chairna Mouse lose? If so, she... If so, then she sealed the fate of all the participants. And yet, there was still someone who wanted Chernomouse gone, was there? Or maybe Chernomouse wasn't the target. Maybe Chernomouse died by chance. Or maybe, right now, I just had thought that I didn't I just had a thought that I didn't want to think about, can I tell you? Be my guest. What if the master did it? And what's your reasoning? Stealing the miracle coin, disrupting the elimination event, she could be trying to stop us from clearing the game or remove all our hopes of escaping. She's secretly preventing us from clearing it. Shouldn't we consider that she enjoys watching us get rattled and shaken as she laughs somewhere? It's the master that took us to the game world. Her magical skill must have something to do with machines or electronics or something. No. So long as we're in the game, it's possible, right? Messing with our magical phones. Ah, uh, very smart. See, like I said, this outside force, the master making them turn on each other. Moving along, though. 
If that was true, then it was hopeless. She was the organizer, at the same time she's the game master. If she chooses to interfere, then no one on the player's side can compete. If the master thought about slaying them, then they'd be slain. If the master wanted to kill them, they'd be instantly dead. It's better if you don't think the master is the culprit. Why is that? If the master wanted to kill us, we'd all be killed without resistance. There'd be no way for us to avoid it. But we don't have any resistance, like you said. That's wrong. The smile that floated thinly on Kanoe's face told Mamori that she thought it was a desperate idea, but very unlikely. If the master feels this way, then there's nothing we can do. Us sixteen magical girls would be locked in the game and she can freely threaten us to death. Her magic is powerful, no point in trying to break us or make a, making us yield. Then I give up. Wait till I finish. She placed her bare plushie on her knees, turning her rotating chair and looking straight at Mamori. If the master wants to kill us because she wants to bully us, then even if we follow that train of thought it wouldn't make any sense. We assume that if we clear the game she'll free us. She places someone with malicious intent among the magical girl um, participants, and using some method, she stole Master Wonder's coin and Chairman Mouse's candy. Why don't you think about that for a second? Hold on. So she's pretty much saying that it's a spy? Or that it's a 17th girl out there somewhere? Either way, well, I mean, no matter what she thought, it doesn't really make sense because of that reason she turned her eyes away. If she follows that low possibility, even if there is a possibility, she'd just be escaping from reality. If the master is the culprit, then it's better to just give up. From a player's position, there's no way of fighting back. Even if we want to challenge her in battle, we should postpone that. In the meantime, we should stick to the theory that someone other than the master is the culprit. It's not as absurd. That is where we should focus on. The master has prepared a game with a high degree of difficulty. If we have our wits about us, we can detect loopholes. For example, matching our minimum number of candies or purchasing a monster picture book in an area town when an enemy monster with um, jump repulsors appears. We prepare loopholes. Those who died without knowing these are the scornful types. It's possible to rob items by force and manipulate the number of candies as well. And even the master's mascot character disagrees with her. Even now, we see that people other than the master are making their moves, so we make ours. She squeezed the bear plushie and tilted her neck back. Kanoe's grip tightened in both arms. As she smiled, the bear continued to deform. The culprit's being rewarded. Momori noticed. Kanoe was angry. She was never one to forgive anyone who dared to touch her family. By family, Kanoe didn't just mean blood relatives. She meant anyone close to her. When she went to a new high school, Momori used to be called Goldfish Poop behind her back. Even Momori heard all those insults. The students kept talking pretty loudly. The students that she graduated with together in middle school wouldn't insult her, even if she would make a mistake. Since she went to a different high school, a certain number of students that gathered up, stu they gathered up to badmouth Momori. Okay, after that they were absent from school for a week. When they came back, they became good children who never said a bad word to her. They all trembled with fear when Kanoe approached them. She probably had something to do with it. Master Wonder was their friend. Mamori clasped her fingers together and placed her hands on her knees, hanging her head down in shame. When she saw an injured person, she went to help without any warning, even when her opponent was over 30 meters. If she thinks what she's doing is right, she has no regrets. She was a real heroine of justice. Momori didn't deserve to call herself that, watching only from the sidelines. No matter what situation she's in, she'll always do the right thing with full power. There was no sarcasm, always straightforward. Momori bit her lips, raised her face, and looked at Kanoe. Kanoe was still smiling. The bear plushie was no longer distorted. I can see through people. You can find their motives, Momori. Together, we'll find the culprit. Momori nodded while chewing her lips. That was an amazing scene. So now it does seem like one of them is still a spy. Like it, like what Fla was saying, it could be the master, but um, why work with that when it's possible that there's a spy among us and all that? We should maybe pay attention to what's going on around us, you know? Um, so at least I think that's what, what I'm getting from this. And, um, and I like the way she 
Two said, you know, it's maybe not the master because we see that the master is not in complete control. If the master wasn't, if the master was in total control, then there wouldn't be a way to um, find a loophole around somebody dying. There wouldn't be a way for Fall to disobey her. So it's clear that um, while she has powerful magic to trap them in the, this game, she isn't all powerful. And to tell the truth, to be able to trap 16 people in a game, like. And to have three days in, three days out. What kind of crazy-ass magic is that, you know? Either way, moving along, though. Um, Detic Bell now. Chernomouse was buried just outside of the town square. They buried her with the giant sunflower seeds that she liked. They left one and buried the hole instead of a tombstone. Or, they left one and buried the hole. Instead, I think they mean filled the hole. Instead of a tombstone, it was a burial mound. The giant sunflower seed was, of course, not real. It was part of Cherenomouse's costume. You could actually eat it. She often did when she was bored. She's the only one who didn't buy any preserved meals at the shop. Lapis Lazuline envied her. Yet, Lapis Lazuline was still sniff sniffling her nose. In order to discuss future plans, Belle turned to Melville. Melville looked at Detic Bell, and when she went to speak, she stopped before her voice reached her throat, and, Melvick sp and Melville spoke. I'm withdrawing from the party. Huh? Melville was more indulgent than usual. We still don't know who the traitor is. Cherno was killed. I cannot trust anyone. My apologies. What Melly's trying to say is, we still don't know who the traitor is, but they're still with us. Cherny was killed. I can't trust anyone anymore. There's no point in having parties. My apologies, but I have to leave. Wait, Melly. Lazuline wiped her tears and her nose with her sleeves and placed her hands on Melville's shoulders. You're going to leave the group, but everyone needs to work together now. You can't leave now, Melly. Are you coming as well? If so, I won't stop you. I'm not going anywhere, but if you're going, Melly, then I'm totally against that. Melville brushed off Lap Lazuline's hand, yet Lazuline kept trying. Melville lightly kicked the ground and stood beyond the grave of sunflower seeds, it was impossible for Lazuline to step over the grave markers, and so she stepped carefully. Detic Bell tried to say something. She couldn't let Melville leave the party. There has to be something, anything she could um, say to make Melville change her mind. That'll make her stay. She thought, she considered, but she couldn't think of anything. So, you're saying you can't trust me? The words that came out of Bell's mouth, Bell's mouth were terribly cold. It was dry. Belle licked her lips, but it was still dry. There was no water. You won't stop Lazuline from coming with you, yet you want to leave the party. So that just means you don't trust me, is that right? Yeah. Melville's body faded away. Her face, her clothes, her bow, her harpoons. Everything melted into the color of the wasteland and she dissolved. Don't like it so... Or, don't take it so badly. I believe you, Belle. That's why I will leave this to you. I will avenge Sherna. The enemy? She is still hiding somewhere. What Melly's trying to say is, don't take this the wrong way, I'm gonna find Cherny's killer and avenger. In the meantime, please try and clear the game. Isn't Cherna's killer the master? No matter what she thought, there was no other way. After the time was up, Cherna's magical phone was immediately somehow altered. Even though before the time up period she had the same number of candies displayed. Since Detic Bell was the one beside her, there was no mistaking it. When they removed her magical phone, for some reason she had one less candy than everyone else. Not to mention, both candies and items being hidden should be impossible. Yet the impossible, yet the impossible has happened. There was only one person who could do it, the Master. Even though it was an event where one person had to be eliminated, Fleff found a loophole and exploited it. Since the Master was angry, she changed the rules of the game, eliminating one person as originally planned. She took out one magical candy so no one could say anything. That's wrong. Remember Fall. He knows the truth. That's wrong. Remember Fall's reaction? He already knew. It wasn't a loophole. He was trying to help the players. It wasn't a loophole. He was giving a way out for the players, right? Er, the Master already prepared the right answer. She didn't get angry. In the beginning, the master had already planned for us to find the right answer. There was no reason for her to get mad. 
At that time, then every one felt guilty, someone was smiling instead. Back then, when we were all feeling horrible, someone was smiling instead? Then Cherna fell, someone was smiling instead. When Cherna fell, someone was smiling instead. Genocyco said, Beware of traitors. Genocyco gave us a message to beware of traitors. She told us there was a traitor among us. That person is the culprit. I will find that person. Whoever they are, they're the culprit. I'll find them. As Melville talked, Lazaline translated. As she repeated what Melville said, Melville slowly disappeared into the landscape. Eventually, she completely disappeared. She stopped talking. Lazaline was waiting to translate, but Melville wasn't talking. So then... Okay. Now, I get all of that. So, Genocyco is the one that gave them the Beware of Traitors thing that um, Melville and Cherna had, and then Cherna died next. So I, th I think Melville has reason to be worried about herself, but I, to me this makes me think none of them are the traitors. If anything, Nyan Nyan is looking the most suspicious to me right now. Yeah, to me Nyan Nyan is definitely looking most suspicious. Unless it is, unless it is Rianetta or... Um, Unless it is Miyakata or Rianetta, but I don't know. Either way, though, I'm liking Melville a lot more now, and I'm liking uh, La liking Lazalina a ton more now. This scene was really good for her. Scene with every scene for um, Detic Bell has been good for Detic Bell. She's just a great character. Okay, but either way, Melville uh, disappeared and stopped talking now. Huh? Melly's gone. She ran across the tombstones, waving both her hands wildly, but touching nothing but the air. Melville had disappeared and left somewhere. Detic Bell started up her magical phone. She looked at the party info screen. There are the names there are the names registered in their party. Detic Bell and Lapis Lazuline and Cherna Mouse too. Melville's name has disappeared. According to Fall, it was easy to drop in and out of a party. Certainly this was pretty easy. Lazuline, what's up? Did you find a way to call Melly back? Can I borrow your phone? Sure, but what for? Lapis Lazuline handed over her phone. Basically nothing's different. Bell, paste, Bell placed her fingertips on the heart-shaped screen, and the standby screen was displayed from there. She moved on. Lazaline's address was displayed. Sorry, I didn't mean that. She returned back a screen and went to the party organization screen. Even there, it's the same as Detic Bell's magical phone. There were the names of three people, with Melville being the exception. She clicked on Cherna Mouse's name. When she removed her from the team, only two people remained. It seemed like the survivors have to remove the deceased from their party. Detic Bell returned the magical phone back to Lazaline, adjusting her detective's cap as well. She felt like she wanted to cry, and she didn't want that to be seen. Melly, she said she's looking for the culprit, right? Is there really a culprit? Was she talking to Detic Bell, or was she talking to herself? Since Lazaline didn't say anything even though Bell didn't respond, she thought it was the latter. Detic Bell gritted her teeth, bending the edges of her mouth downward. With regret, a feeling of tiredness and, helpli and helplessness began appearing. As long as Cherna Mouse was there, she didn't think anything could go wrong. Even Cherna thought that as long as she was there, she'd puff out her chest and do her best to protect everyone. Although her strength was hidden, and she, did and she drove the other parties away, she was a reliable ally. Cherna Mouse was killed unreasonably, in a way unrelated to her strength. Although Tetic Bell was the party leader, the real heavy hitter was Cherna Mouse, and the ones who gave orders to Cherna Mouse and the one who gave orders to Chel um, Cherna Mouse was Melville. Now, without Cherna Mouse, Melville had left as well. Only Detic Bell was left. It may seem like Lazaline was also left behind. However, she was decisively different from Detic Bell. Melville invited Lazaline to leave. She said that she won't stop her if she comes along, meaning, meaning it was fine to form a party with her, which means Melville's reason for leaving the party was Detic Bell. Did she not trust Detic Bell, or was Detic Bell just not important? When she thought about those things, it seemed like she was about to cry. Detic Bell was the nominal leader, yet she had no achievements that could be noticed. She's never opened a new area even once. All of them were performed by other parties. Inside the game, Detic's, Detic Bell's magical skill was useless, yet she had experience as a detective. There was still the knowledge that she had learned from detective novels. 
Even if I couldn't use my magical skill, I could still be useful. However, when the game started, she couldn't open the area. She didn't have any leadership skills. Any instructions she gave to Chairman Mouse or Melville were ignored. So, maybe we went like, alright, we found you, to Cherney's killer. She'll get. So maybe we went like, alright, we found you, to Cherney's killer. She'll give up. I know that she's probably walking around somewhere, but wonder if she's dangerous. Detic Bell locked eyes with Lapis Lazuline, who, was, who wasn't preoccupied with worrying or fear. Melville invited Lazuline. She invited Lazuline to leave Detic Bell's party. From under her detective hat, Detic Bell glared at Lazuline. Lazuline pumped her chest with her right hand. She was reassuring her. Don't you worry about a thing. As long as I, Lapis Lazuline, is here, you're going to be completely safe, Belsey. Soon, the game had temporarily ended. Detic Bell returned to rea reality into being Shinobu Hioka, no longer a magical girl but a human figure instead. However, inside she was still smoldered. She beat the walls of her apartment, then she contacted her office applying for a 10-day vacation. If she did this twice, would she coldly be kicked out, or would they wonder what she's up to? Because she didn't like either option, she only told them the important stuff and turned off her phone. She took out her magical phone, she browsed the net. She had stored the area code of the phone number in Lazuline's address book. She investigated that and the name of her city was immediately displayed. Detic Bell drew in her notepad and she looked at her current timetable. Detic Bell couldn't use her magical skill in the game, however, in reality she could use it. Firstly, Lapis Lazuline, she had to look for areas where she was active, the same as how she investigated Magical Daisy's real identity. She moved in reality, increasing the information she got on her real life identity. As Melville said, if the Master was communicating with the magical girl, she had to press them somehow. She can't turn her back on anything. Even if it turns out she's a pure magical girl, that's still useful information. That means she could increase her circle of trusted people by one. That's right. First it had to be Lapis Lazuline. Her ally was killed, another left, yet her mood was just fine. Was she a carefree magical girl, or was there something hidden behind her attitude? Detic Bell will identify that. That's interesting. So we have Bilzy going to um, investigate Lazuline now. I really like that, and yeah, definitely separating this into two separate videos. Geez, 47 minutes long. Um, gosh, that was so, so good. Um, man, that makes me like Melville a lot more and trust Melville way more now, actually. Um, so yeah, I like Melville a lot now. I like, I think I like every character, and I'm really hoping they work together. I think it would be good since they're the two teams that have the most, uh, sort of, I guess, um, I don't want to call it thinking power, but the most investigative power. I'd love to see if, um, Shadow Gale and Flesh, since they're the only two left, team up with, um, Lapis Lazuline and, um... Lapis Lazuline and Detic Bell, since they're the only two left on their team as well. So it'd be cool if those four joined up. Uh, but either way, um, I also kind of like seeing Melville go rogue and do her own thing. Um, and the fact that the one that gave her and... Um, and the fact that uh, that's kind of why they knew they had seen her, was that um, Yumenashima had given the don't trust the traitors or whatever note to uh, Cherna and Melville. But either way... Moving along, um, thank you so, so much for watching. Like, if you did like the video, comment down there. Tell me what you thought of all this, uh, my thoughts on it, reaction and all that. Um, subscribe for more Magical Girl Raising Project and more. Uh, second half of this chapter will probably, probably be up a day or two after this. Um, follow on Twitter if you want to try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel. Talk to you there as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.